I'm really interested in what Maria is going to say because she's talking about deep waters, and um, I know, for instance, that Avebury is sitting on one of the largest aquifers in the country, and uh, it's just fascinating the relationship between the water and the chalk and the energy. So, without further ado, I give you Maria Wheatley. Well, hi. Uh, so far, we've had wonderful talks by Peter Knight saying what you can see uh, in rock shapes, and Caroline and Gary gave a really well-researched presentation about alignments. So I'm going to show you what you can't see at an ancient site, and, but the energies that you can work with to heal yourselves and to heal the land and to access the Earth's Akashic records at the esoteric center of an ancient site. Because as we, as Andrew rightly said, when we come to a place like Avebury, and this is an aerial shot that I took, uh, we see a circular shape, which is a very common uh, motif. Why? You could go into the symbolism and all the intellectual theories that you like. Oh, it represents eternity. Why a circle? Why indeed do churchyards become circular? And many of us may have noticed that. And this is what we're going to look at, the invisible energies beneath the ground that the earth emits. Because when we talk about earth energies, we think about the earth herself. We think about Gaia. But what is Gaia? And, and, what, and what's my relationship to Gaia? Gaia is far, far more fluidic and watery, then she is solid. She has far deeper waters than geologists will talk about, and that's what we're going to be having a look at. So we're going to understand about the circular shapes and about how these uh, energies can heal us and how the ancients recognized these healing energies and placed particular sites above them and how the mystery schools reacted to them and the masons and possibly even the New World Order. So again, we see a beautiful site like Stonehenge, circular in shape. And when we move to the most complete stone circle in the, well, in the country, actually, it's really retained its circular shape. It has some kind of this natural mound by it. Why is it placed there? And we're going to be looking at the art of placement. So what is the art of placement all about? Why the circular shape? Why place Swinside there? Why place Avebury there? Why place Stonehenge on sloping ground? Yeah? So one side of the stones have to go in deeper than the other to get that ring around the top. It was an engineering nightmare. So why did our ancestors do this? They were looking at the fluidic element, the element of water. And when we think about the uh, element of water deep underground, as Andrew said, we think of normal aquifers. Yeah? And an aquifer, for example, could be rainwater that fell yesterday, 20 years ago, 30,000 years ago, a millennia ago. And it goes deep down in levels like this. So that first level you can see is where the rainwater comes down. That's an unconfined aquifer. Then probably you get something like a clay, clay area, and that can make another confined aquifer. Then you get a very deep aquifer like that. And you can bore wells down then. I've bored wells with my uh, late father. Uh, but we see water a little bit differently. And I'm going to first of all say about this type of water... And we're going to call it Yang water because it falls from Father Sky. Now, any good water diviner will tell you the reason why your dowsing rods react is because from that deep water below is sending up this triad water line, which you can see uh, in the middle. That's what uh, water diviners tend to react to, this one here. Now, each side of that water line, and that's this bit here, yeah, throws off this bit here, you get what's called a parallel, each side, like a mirror image of that yang water. And the old diviners used to say, the distance from here to here is the depth. So if you walked, for instance, <coughs> 20 feet or so from here, you would know that that's going to be the uh, water line because that's where the water reacted to. 
So we see these parallels as a rough judging method. The distance from uh, the waterline to a parallel is the depth. Yeah, so it could be 40 feet, 100 feet, 130, depending on the geology. But if the, the dowser rod is following one of these, they become circles of energy around like this. So that's the parallel each side are very, very circular. And that's been known since about the 1500s. It's actually called the bishop's rule, even though it has nothing to do with the bishop. That's the Christians trying to get in on the act. So we see all of these circles uh, like this. And if you live above that type of water, it's carcinogenic. It emits what's called a geopathic stress. It's a nightmare. So you get devices and things to counteract that, and you can commune to it. You could get a, a different types of pendulums to clear it. But that's known as geopathic stress. Yeah. Perfectly fine to drink. <laughs> Perfectly fine when it comes up, up out of the ground. That, uh, that is for sure. But to live above it is very, very powerful. Yang water. Now, when we kind of look at more in depth at the Yang water, this is a tried and tested uh, Y rod. Has anyone used a Y rod for water divining? Yep, I see a, a, few, a few hands up. It's really a time-honoured test, but you, a water diviner can tell how you're going to react to energies by if you get a reaction here, which that rod does there. That's a natural way of divining. But if you've kind of been taught it from a left brain method, you're not going to get the reaction here in the negative band by this Dowson rod. You're probably going to hit it here. And that's the difference between how people react to energies. So it's always uh, good fun in water divining and dowsing to find out if what you're called a negative dowser or a positive one. And that's how they used to do dowsing in about the 1930s, for example. And we've kind of uh, fluffed away from that uh, in a way. So that's, uh, that will look a bit geopathic stress. But the worst type of geopathic stress you can get is when two yang streams cross at a, a near right angle, like a, the, literally the X shape. And I think this is why when we were at school and through our education system, that's wrong. Wrong to live above this type of deep water. And in esoteric water divining, relating to the water dragons in the land, whenever you have this pattern here, it represents a lack of protection from the water dragon. Yeah, in kind of Chinese law and later. And we're going to see the opposite soon. So that's a lack of protection. So when you're in on that energy field, long-term exposure, I mean, 5, 10, 15 years, you will become ill. There was a fantastic survey done in Germany. I love the, uh, love the Germans because they really do look at dowsing far, far more complex than us. And they did an experiment People that were ill, they said, OK, we're going to put you on a geopathic stress zone and we're going to do a, a control example and we're going to see heal, heal, how you're going to heal and who is going to heal the fastest. And it was found that if you're sleeping on geopathic stress, your body takes ages to self-heal. And it doesn't matter if you're having acupuncture, chemo, RT, it doesn't matter. The earth emissions are more powerful. Now, when my late father was lucky enough to be given all of the unpublished manuscripts by a master dowser called Guy Underwood, he started to look at these manuscripts and realised that the ancients created an esoteric centre at every single ancient site they made. It could be Stonehenge, it could be the pyramids, it could be one of those wonderful stelae of Sardinia. They would make an esoteric center. So what's the esoteric center? It isn't an alignment of lines at all. It's what's happening deep below the ground. Now, I've shown you aquifers. Now, in esoteric water divining, the very, very, very deep water isn't for the sky coming down at all. It's generated chemically deep within the womb of Gaia. Yeah? Independent of rainfall. You're nutter, would say a geologist. You're mad. Gaia can't produce water. Sulfur, silver, plutonium, uranium. You're telling me she can't produce water. 
An old Chinese Jia man who taught our family many, many years ago said Peking, the esoteric center of China, Beijing, uh, was under a deep, deep sea of yin water. And that's why the uh, Chinese have water associated with money, don't they? It's in their kind of feng shui. Currency. We can relate money to uh, the very, very deep water. Well, they were scouring around there, some uh, Americans that were linking into China to find out, you know, was there oil below certain Chinese uh, areas? And they hit upon very, very deep water. They hit upon a sea the size of the North Sea. They didn't know where it was coming from. It made no sense to be down there. Of course, you know, an esoteric water diviner would go, told you so, just like that. Because very, very deep water emits this energy spiral pattern, which the first person to recognize this called it a blind spring, Old Smith, from uh, the old uh, the day of the uh, British Society of Dances, etc. But he was also very high up in the British Museum. He was a top archaeologist. And he said wherever he went to an ancient site, he would come across not this spiral pattern, but bang, he would call it a blind spring. Yeah? Hamish Miller, I'm sure we've all heard of Hamish Miller, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> right, you're buying the pints later. Uh, well, Hamish, when uh, he was listening to my father and I's work on this type of energy, he still called it a blind spring. We're going to call it yin water later. He would say that you have these amazing earth currents, Mary and Michael, but where they hit a blind spring, they veer off like that. The water dragon is more powerful, in a sense, to the earth dragon. They're both equal uh, in a way. But this, amidst this pattern, it goes round and round and round and round. The ancients at Avebury, the ancients at Stonehenge, the ancients at the pyramids, they would all, always call that the esoteric centre of the land. Yeah? And that's why when you have, you see, these wonderful stately homes, they have a long driveway, don't they? Then they have a round motif, don't they? As you kind of go around in the car, they have found the esoteric centre of the land, Maybe not this, I'm going to show you their pattern later. But that's it, you're heading towards the esoteric centre. Powerful, powerful concept. So we're going to anchor that when we look at some ancient sites later. That's the centre, the near centre. That's why the obelisk stone at Avebury is not at the geometric centre. The geometric centre is nine feet away. The altar stone, the holiest of holies at Stonehenge. Her beauty was amazing. 16 feet high. Beautiful green sandstone, flexed with red garnet. Marked that position. And the energies will come up the uh, stones. But in the moment, we're going to anchor that. That's the esoteric centre. That's why the centres are off-centre in an ancient site. Now, surround. When you're under a huge amount of underground water, deep underground water, you have the spiral pattern, then you have this circular pattern. It's called a primary halo, yeah? known by dowsers for over 80 years. Very energizing, this is. So imagine now we've got standing stones on that central band there. Yeah? Now, really powerful amounts of water, like uh, Peking, would have six of those. But we're looking at the threefold now. Now, this piece here in the middle is like a shadow area, and it's constantly interacting with this bit here, about four times a day. So if you imagine this bit recharges that bit, then it comes back out. It's an earth tide. One of the most amazing things about an earth tide uh, is that if you stand in between two standing stones, around about, say, between two and four o'clock in the morning, it's never when you want it to, a bit like eclipses, <laughs> and you stand there, you feel the earth tide come towards you. And I remember I was about 10 years old, and uh, most, uh, can you remember the children of the stones? Yeah. Who can remember that? Well, after watching that, my dad used to take me to Avebury and then say, you know, at terrible times of the, the day, my mum used to freak. Uh, and to feel these earth tides, they're amazing. Just stand there and you feel it. 
So that's why you have the circular motif at stone circles, this reacting to the water dragons beneath the ground. And the churchyards, how many people here have noticed a circular churchyard? Yeah, they are very frequent, aren't they? Because they're adopting the pagan method of finding the esoteric center, which could be the altar or the font, depending on how the church is laid out. And then the graveyard is around this. This is quite highly energetic. So the spiral is more calming. Yeah, that's kind of calming energy. And when we've tested it out with David Webb and other people, it's emitting a frequency that will bring your brain into its alpha mode. This, on the other hand, is energizing. It's energizing the stones. It can energize you. So if you find these naturally in the landscape, which I've shown Italian uh, architects, then if you're designing something like a hospital or something, you could have this little bit here to recuperate. Do you see what I mean? And then you can work with the energies that way. And I've worked with nurses in America, especially, God love her, Cheryl Jove, where we've laid out wards to get off the grid lines like the curry net and the Hartman grid so that your body self-heals and you're not in geopathic stress. So we got the spiral and we got the circle. That's what the ancients were looking for. So the size of a stone circle tends to be dictated by the energies you can't see, those invisible earth energies beneath your feet. Now, especially powerful, six-fold ones of these, they emit a divine horseshoe shape, which dancers over the past 80 years have recognised and call a secondary halo. Now, this is very, very protective. It's believed by dancers over the past 80 years. <coughs> have you also noticed the design canon of some medieval towns and cities? They're circular, aren't they? Yeah? And this is always on those ancient walled cities, this shape. It's also said in nature, yeah, that if you have wild chickens, yes, at one time they were wild, <laughs> a bit like ducks, well, they survived foxes. They survived down the evolutionary chain because when you just start dousing where they nest, they would be looking for this type of earth energy. And it's almost like the animal kingdom knows that that's a territory of divine protection, for instance. So if we imagine an ancient site or a walled city, it would have this going around it, very, very powerful. And what does water have more than anything? Memory, doesn't it? Water has memory. So when you go to an ancient site, like Stonehenge, for example, this is the geo spiral there. That's the altar stone. Unfortunately, one of the greater trilophons fell on it. That's kind of a depiction of the altar stone. It shows you that this area is full of the uh, geo spiral energy. And that's what I mean by off-center. That's the where the heel stone was. It didn't mark the geometric center. So when I take people to places like Stonehenge, we start working with the Akashic records of the earth, the holy history of the site. What is the site going to tell me? How am I going to you know, really tune in to the past? And you'd be surprised what the, the site gives in its holy history to you. And also, what are we made of? 70% water. 70% water. water, exactly. So... Now here, we've all heard that kind of motif by L'Oreal, because you're worth it, yeah? Well, when you go to these sites, you can really start to work with your body water. Because what I believe in is that it's not just our brains that hold on to memory. It's our body water, yeah? And so if we can act with these waters by telling them what we're going to do and working with them, we can start to release our own kind of emotional energy and begin to self-heal, yeah? And also what we can do is a beautiful cleansing routine because in ancient Druidry, at the center of the world was a massive well, water. And around that massive well grew nine hazelnut trees. Yeah, hazel for water divine. So beneath here, we've gone down to those, those deep waters and we can begin to allow our bodies to heal the energies of the past and to rejuvenate, yeah? And when you rejuvenate above these beautiful energy points, you feel clean on the inside out, yeah? 
And, uh, you know, I actually think it's better than L'Oreal products any day of the week. You rejuvenate on these, you, your skin starts to feel differently. I'm going to show you how you can take water to these places, and I'm going to show you an ancient rite of Avery that they used to do to heal waters. Because, I don't know if you we all know that water has memory, yeah? I only had a couple of straight jobs in my life, yeah? One of my straight jobs was, well, believe it or not, I was an RT clerk for radiotherapy. And I was taught about water at the same time, and uh, they used to type it out. You had to flush the loo twice if you're on strong radio chemicals or, or chemotherapy. I remember going to uh, the chief of the admin at the hospital and saying, I'm oh, a water diviner, you should get these people port a loose and they shouldn't be going into the whole of the energy system of water. Yeah? No. A friend of mine got uh, cancer about 10 years ago, and I said, oh my God, let me read the leaflet. It's going to tell you to flush the loo twice. Yeah? So we need to go to these places to heal our waters today. If one little drop of that dirty, disgusting little chemical of fracking gets into the deep waters, we are in trouble. So we need to think about water energies as much as uh, earth energies per se. So when we look at the whole of Stonehenge now, we've got the ditch and the bank, as, as the Henge monument, we've got the X and the Y holes, we've got the blue stones here, and the blue stones are known as the healing stones because they're associated quite often with springs on the Priscelli. It's these blue stones that are on the healing uh, water band here. So this shows you how to see a sight through the invisibility. And as I say, as you walk across, you do feel a difference uh, in, in energies, even if you don't dance, or even if you do dance. And nature is a wonderful thing, because nature knows, when it's not seeded by man, where to grow. So where you have these amazing yew trees that are you know, very vintage, they are always above the geo spiral. And more than that, uh, Guy Underwood from the 1930s to the 1960s investigated how animals give birth naturally. Because if you've got a, a bitch about to give birth, she wants to break free into nature, doesn't she? You don't want to go in a kennel. The dog knows them far better than what you do, uh, Master. They would want to break out and give birth above the geospiral pattern. And it's found when these animals do that, their offspring is actually much, much stronger. And also, what Guy noticed was a lot about the stories that the veterans of World War II told about interacting with the landscape. You're cold. You've got a backpack. You're probably facing death. You don't know what you're facing in the World War II. God love them that they did that. But the ones that came back had very strange stories to be told, and nobody in the 1940s, stiff upper lip and all of that, could even speak about them, let alone bringing in a metaphysical concept. So Guy said, I'll fill that role, I'll listen to the veterans. And they were saying that when they noticed where cows had laid, or there was a natural slight of dip in the land, they'd lie down there and they'd coop it up. And in the night, a goddess would come to them. It could be their mum, their sister, their grand, their aunt, their wife, telling them they would survive the war. And they all had that story to tell. tell. So Guy went out there and he started to douse these lands and realised they were above particular types of spiral energy patterns. And even when Bernadette in France started to scratch and pour at the ground and the waters of Lourdes came forth, she had a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I think the goddess can appear above this energy pattern and give us divine inspiration. And I know a lot of people, myself included, who have uh, been graced with that. Now, when we think about the surface waters of the land, and we look at rivers and springs, we know that the new and full moons affect them, don't we? You get high tides and that sort of thing. Well, these deep waters are not affected by the new and full moon. <coughs> they are affected normally 
by six days after a new moon or six days after a full moon or if you're higher or lower latitude at the first quarter, so that's a day, a day later. And uh, it's been found that when we look at the records of the Druids, they would pick their mistletoe six days after a new moon. They would be in this rhythm of the quarters rather than the new and full. And this is when that spiral pattern like this changes its rotational direction like that. It's when you have a well of water that goes very deep. That too will have these amazing spiral patterns and energies that we can, again, work with. They're very, very healing. So just by going to a site six days after a new or full moon, you're becoming in harmony with the uh, spiral and circular energies, which are very, very powerful. Now, when Guy had these manuscripts, he died, unfortunately, and uh, a water diviner uh, said, I'll have them published. And he wrote the book, The Pattern of the Past, and it's quite seminal. But unfortunately, the wrong manuscript went to print. And uh, my dad had seven of them, and painstakingly, he read every single one to find out which one Guy really did want published. And in his pioneering research, a lot of people started to bicker at him and say, oh, well, at Stonehenge he found this pathway and it wiggled off. It's where people walk. Yes, but later on in the next manuscript, Guy had figured that out and said, that's a remnants trail. So Guy Underworks' work kind of hit a real low in the 1970s when you had uh, other dowsers uh, criticising his work. Guy came up with the idea of the blind spring pattern, but it was Reginald Alder Smith was the first to quote blind spring. And then Guy did all of this on top. So after working with his uh, energies for about 25 years, he kept saying about an aquastat, an aquastat. An aquastat is a fissure system in the earth. It could have been where a stream once was, and it's dried up. And after doing a lot of work at Avebury, Stonehenge, and sites uh, around the world, I had that eureka moment and thought, no, an aquastat isn't that. It's very, very deep water, that yin water, where it starts to flow as a stream. So I got quite a few independent dowsers from uh, Germany and Italy. We did an experiment and found out that they are highly likely to have water at deep level, but Guy was right as well, you can get uh, dry ones as well. So these emit off an amazing energy pattern, and as well as having the geospiral pattern, the ancients were looking for aquastats, and where they kind of moved around the land would determine certain features in churches because they are healing. Just like the geospiral pattern is healing, the underground streams are as well. And when we look to a site such as Stonehenge, we know that that is really, really healing. It has groundwater, your traditional yang water aquifer. But below that, you have deep, deep aquifers uh, at Stonehenge. Back in the day, when you could actually interact with Stonehenge freely and uh, not kind of being paraded around the outside, unless you pay your 37 quid to get on the inside, that's the uh, net cost of uh, English heritage, well, Guy spent 200 visits alone trying to get the aquastat energies there and to try and really understand Stonehenge from a water perspective. And one of uh, his water maps is this one here. This is the kind of geospiral altar area and these are the kind of huge, huge rivers coming off that are, are aquastats and this is the, the heel stone over here. And Avebury is even more intense than that. It's massive, you just kind of throw, because it's much bigger space for one Avebury. So if you kind of tenfold the amount of streams, you get an idea. So if you've just got some dowsing rods and you're walking around, you're going to get reaction, 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 reaction. Uh, but you might not know what you're dousing. If you tune in to that which you uh, douse one thing at a time, you can start to decode a whole area and know which parts are healing and know which parts are energizing. 
And this is the way I think we can move forward uh, in today's modern day architecture. And it's a real shame that it's the Germans interested in this and it's the Italians and the Americans rather than uh, the, uh, the English. But like I've said time and time again over many, many years, that if you have a standing stone and it's rooted into the chalk bedrock, because quite often they're not in earth, you have two energy bands below, you've got seven going up, and as people will know, we did prove this with Rodney Hale, we got the signal and the frequency coming out of these energy bands. But if you have two aquastats flowing like this, and the, these patterns go inward, which in occultism is protection, then you have healing energy emitted through these energy bands. So we went to Rollright to try and test this out with, uh, with Rodney Hale and David Webb and uh, some others to see if it was changing a frequency compared to that stone over there that was not really rooted into the aquastats. And the frequencies coming out of here were all, all harmonic. Very, very encouraging your body to literally self-heal. And this is the kind of hidden uh, rites of even a church uh, these days. They have these energy points uh, in them. So for me, the, the aquastar energies are the most healing and the most harmonic energy you can have. Uh, that the earth admits. But the other type of energy that is really very, very healing is this. It's called a branch spiral. It's where you get a deep river. Can you imagine that to be a very deep river from which you have these spirals flowing like this. And quite often you get, for instance, Long barrens and their chambers sited above these, which is far, far more about healing and initiation than it is about death rites. Many years ago, uh, I used to, uh, for a laugh, it was actually, I mean, on, on uh, Lord Bath's point of view, every sort of like couple of months, I used to go along for Sunday dinner to talk about Danielson or astrology or something for pure entertainment, as he would say to his guests. But one thing that I did learn uh, from him instantly when I went to uh, Longleat House, he's got his private quarters at the top, he's very artistic actually, he's got a whole zodiac of this kind of 3D artwork mesh, mesh uh, above his dining room area. But the first thing he said to me was, can you find the spirals? My family have always said that we live above the spirals. And this type of energy here is life-enhancing. It is very, very good to live above. So the Masons, they would look for these patterns and put stately homes above them. The ancient Neolithic would put their long barrows uh, above it. And also, by the time of the Iron Age, you used to get clusters of a roundhouse and then a kind of area for grain, etc. And they had a whole cosmology of how uh, to live as well. So these are really, really life-enhancing. When that master dowser Guy Underwood was in the Stonehenge environs, uh, he noticed, uh, for instance, is the sound gone? Yay. <laughs> Houston. <laughs> we have a problem. Could you, could you pick up the other one? Uh, yep, this one. Yep. Tom? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so uh, these were uh, seen as to be very, very uh, healing. Now, Guy Underwood looked at a lot of antiquarian reports. Uh, like Aubrey, Stukeley, and those very famous antiquarians, and had a look at their reports of what they said about finds above patterns that he doused at Stonehenge to what they discovered. It was a Herculean task, but he did that. And he noticed that time and time again, they were describing a very similar thing. Basically, an antiquarian was a posh person with lots of dosh, making somebody else dig, and uh, they were posh people with uh, shovels. That's what, what they were. Anyway, one of the uh, posh people with shovels was called uh, Sir Richard Cole Hoare, who got William Cunningham and his team to dig for him. 
And they were in the Stonehenge environs, and he described digging down to what they call the old surface level, that's the ground level where you used to get interment on a round barren of uh, the Bronze Age. And just outside, he noticed it stopped him in his tracks because he was looking at this skull that had perfectly white teeth. It didn't have show any sign of rotting whatsoever. And it wasn't in the uh, cyst, that's a cut-out bit in the chalk bedrock, which does allow preservation. So anyway, so uh, Carl Hall, he was a bit taken back about this and said, see how far you can throw it and see, see how it will break. So they threw it and uh, it didn't smash. And then he got it back and said, throw it a bit harder. And so he threw it and it took three attempts for the skull to really kind of break. So Guy went there and noticed it was above these life-enhancing patterns, okay? Now, to the ancient Chinese, it's more important where you're buried than where you live, yeah? Because your dynasty will live on, yeah? If you find the right place to be buried. And this is a kind of ancient burial technique they were using in the Stonehenge environs. Because the Wessex were very, very rich. The Wessex people, culture of Stonehenge, it wasn't an equal society by that time. Uh, and so they were looking for particular energy patterns. And it's, a, it's quite a, a beautiful thing because spirit gives us people when we meet. And somebody came along out of the blue once and said, can I do some dousing with you around Avebury? And they were really talking about, well, we want death rites, we want this, what do you think's going on, Maria? So I said, oh, you know, I think this is going on, I think that's, look at, look at Westminster. Westminster's very like that, uh, for instance. And I said, I think it was for, for a dynasty. And then I, he was just asking so many questions, far, far more than anyone else I'd taken out. And I just said, you know, where are you coming from? You know, you're asking really amazing questions. He said, well, I didn't tell you at the beginning because I didn't want you to be, you know, have a, an idea and try and impress me. But I'm digging, I'm designing rather, the largest grave, uh, graveyards in the world. One of which is in the Wirral uh, at Liverpool. And we want to introduce ancient death rites. So, you know, he is actually developing these things. We need to think about how we live and die in relationship to Gaia now. We've all come of age. It's not about proving this now. It's about living in harmony. So I think these, these patterns could be amazing for people to uh, live above. And more importantly, say you've got, you know, like an orphanage or something. Let's put them in the harmonic, the most harmonic places in the landscape would be worthwhile. Now, when we come to a kind of a, a place like the heel stone, which is very powerful, because I'm sure lots of us have stood by the heel stone and felt energy, haven't we? It is very, very powerful, isn't it? These uh, standing stones, they really are. But if you imagine that when an underground normal aquifer, remember the Yang water I was telling you about? Imagine that's kind of coming up now to one of those spiral patterns. It too creates a spiral. So that when you are around this kind of amazing circular energy, anything that's coming up to it will circle and create this. To the mystery schools, this was about where you stand for protection and where you stand to receive energy into your body, which really around the heel stuff is anywhere. <laughs> you have to actually stand in the exact right position. But it's about looking at the landscape a little bit differently through the invisibility. So what I say to people when they go to uh, the heel stone, if you can, you can't really do it so much uh, now, or any stand in stone, walk around it 360 degrees and see if there's a point where you really do feel a, a movement forward, being drawn down, down to the earth. And if you, you feel that, that's when it's like you're being received uh, by, by the deep waters. So you don't really have to have any knowledge of this. You can see now a stone circle, the esoteric center, it's going to be the geospiral healing pattern. The energizing bit is going to be where the stone circle is going around. Now, the ancients, I think, were working with water completely differently to what we do today. Has anyone heard of the Templar's Bath Stone in Avebury? A few? Yeah. You've probably been there because uh, you're a local. <laughs> well, it's an amazing thing because it's not in situ anymore. I don't know if you were shown, shown the place where it was in situ. But this is the Templar's Bath. It's a huge, huge piece of sarsin stone. 
And on the inside here, you have a hollow basin. Yep, there. And it is so smooth to the touch. It's like touching velvet because it's had water after water after water. It's a basin for charging up water. Because when this sacred stone was in situ, it was a place above that spiral pattern. So any other water placed into it gets like alchemically charged. But the fascinating thing for me about this very unusual Avery stone is this bit. I don't know if you can just see it, I'll show you a close up. It's a, like a plug hole, yeah? Through two feet or so of a, I see it there? It's through two feet or so of, of a sarsen stone, which is really, really difficult to drill. And more than that, it's in the shape of a pentagram. So it's really, really an amazing stone. So we, we can charge up our own water above these type of things. It's what the ancients were doing. It's got nothing to do with the Templars. I mean, it was found near the uh, ruins of the Templar Chapel, high on the Avery Downs, and that's why it's called the Templar's Bar. But we can see a close-up of it now, and it's literally silver. It's full of gunk there. But that, that's the kind of shape. You can't really make out the pentagram uh, shape, but that's what it is. So anything placed within these energy fields, we can start to self-heal our water. So what I encourage people to do when they come to an ancient site with me is to get a little bit of water. You know, like those little like back flower remedy bottles, that sort of thing. Take one of those with you, fill it up with, uh, with water, and charge it up in an energy field. Now you've got a mother essence. You can take a couple of drops of that and put it in all of your water. You can bathe in it. You can do anything. You're recharging your water uh, alchemically with this because it was believed uh, by the master dowsers that anything that comes into harmony with that geospiral pattern is alchemy. Yeah, alchemy. And do you know what? Our ancient Neolithic ancestors, they were so cool when it came to water that one uh, archaeologist called Tim Champion, yay, Champion, what a name, I wish that was me. Uh, Tim uh, Champion, he noticed that every single causeway enclosure across England, Wales, everywhere, Europe, were at the meeting point of two aquifers. Yeah, and that's when you have huge amount of radiation coming through, electro, electromagnetic uh, radiation coming through. It's absolutely intense. So they knew that they were laying out a kind of ley line network. And in my own journey with Dowson, uh, I discovered the uh, uh, elongated skulls all around the Stonehenge uh, environs, uh, mainly to begin with through Dowson and then later through investigation. And this is a huge, huge, huge mound called uh, the Tillsbury Old Ditch uh, Mound that had a Neolithic uh, queen skull round about here. But this is what it would look like originally. This is based on Fuzzle's Lodge uh, by uh, archaeologists. And these tend to be on long kind of streams as well of, of, uh, of aquifers. So I think in my own research of finding the long-skulled uh, people of this area, that they were the first to really lay out the ley line network. Why? What evidence is for that? If you even take you know, one of Hamish's lines or whatever, and you look at the Neolithic sites in the straight line, you get all the Neolithic, that's the long-skulled people, and then after that you get the Bronze Age sites of that, after that you get the Iron Age and then you get the churches, you, you know, the kind of thing. But the genesis of that was these long-skulled people. When I tracked uh, the Queen, what I think was the Queen of Stonehenge, down to Cambridge uh, University, it's one of those moments where you, you've got to know that you've got to believe in the goddess. And I just thought, why is this curator here? She's getting on my nerves, don't like her energy field. And I was kind of ranting to Great Spirit to give me five minutes alone with the Neolithic elongated skulled queen. And you think at Cambridge they'd have like these top, you know, even a mobile phone, but no, they had an old fashioned pager. And the pager went off and she said, Oh, you don't mind if I leave you alone for a couple of minutes, do you, Maria? No, of course not. You're only uh, allowed to take one photo. Of course, of course. So you go off. 
And, and what I did is I felt uh, all around her head, and her head was coming out here, yeah. I've got a picture in uh, my book, uh, The Elongated Skulls of Stonehenge. But I did an energy field all around her, and I realized, I think, she had definitely had a, a throat chakra, still active, and a third eye, and two crown chakra energy points. I think they had like an extra chakra point, and it was like being around a crystal skull. Okay, that could have been subjective. Have I been around a 5,000-year-old uh, skull on an average day? No. Nope. So maybe that was subjective, but I think there was something uh, more going on. And they were quite short people as well. They're only about five foot four. They weren't giants, yeah? You can tell that by the long bones, the femur that they were, they were buried with. So I think these long-skulled people that made these monuments, the long barons, and the causeway enclosures and curses monuments as well were also laying out the stone circles. Yeah, why? When you look at Avebury, you know, for instance, that it's not all the same time span, is it? It's a composite model. So it has one phase going on, then it has another phase, and it has another phase, doesn't it? And when we look to the genesis again, go back to the starting phase, these wonderful cove stones. Uh, according to archaeologists such as you know Josh Pollard, uh, etc., they say these are the Neolithic bits, and the stone circle is later, probably about 500 years later. So these stones here could have been contemporary, for instance, with uh, the Long Barrow phase. I think this is phase one of um, Avebury, but we're told that they're Neolithic, aren't we? That the form, everything started either 3000 BC or very conveniently 500 years later. Everything, wasn't it? 2500 BC. I think they had a bingo moment. And uh, that's, that is meaningful. But coming out of Oxford pretty soon, they have found the most simplest artifact and everything is going to get shifted back to the Mesolithic. It's got to wait for one paper and then everything, well, I think, will change. And we'll see this as a Mesolithic phase one. But these really amazing long-skulled people were raising the heaviest stones. They raised the cove stones and the obelisk. Yeah, they raised the red stone in Yorkshire. And no other heavier stone, especially at Avery, would ever be raised again, apart from, you could say, the southern portals. And when we look at some of their skulls, for example, and we look to, this is the a male, from uh, a barrow at uh, Stonehenge. Very straight face. If you sort of mean very straight like this, this is uh, more of an Allen skull from uh, Iraq and uh, Iran. But that same flatness there, and you see a flatness there. She had a flatness there. But look at the length of her skull. Yeah? And th these are the people that were laying out the first systems. And if you did a reconstruction uh, with them, then you could see, if you use Tutankhamun, King Tut, who had not such uh, an elongated skull, they still had elongated skulls themselves, that hers is uh, much, much uh, longer like that. And I've recently tracked down a child, so you can say they're not, uh, you know, they are born this way. I don't know if anyone's been to the uh, Hypogeum in Malta. Anyone been to Hypogeum? few hands, God, you're going to have to get yourself down to Hypogeum. Yeah, come on. It's amazing. The ancients, with their long skulls, built a monument two stories deep into the ground with beautiful carved ceilings. They had an oracle room. So if you were stood in the oracle room and you said, Maria, every single chamber would echo with that word. So they don't even sell that. They don't even say it's mentioned that much. You'd think that'd be the selling point, wouldn't you? Oh my God, you're coming to my country, you're coming to my monument. And anyway, I, I asked them ages ago, could I see their long-skulled people? And they were in denial and saying, no, they were all round skulls. And when I went a year later, when they had the new visitor centre, I was horrified to see how they're treating our ancestors. In a comic font, they had long-skulled aliens. Yeah? written on the wall of the visitor centre, of which I complained. And they said, there are no skulls here, but there is, from Oxford, there's paper after paper showing you their long skulls. 
And it was these, these people. Incidentally, I was with this mad Irishman doing this show called Megalithic Odyssey. Uh, he was a really tall Irishman, six foot six he was. My God, he had presence. Yeah. And anyway, he was a renegade type of person. And he said, we're going to get in the Oracle room. And then I'm going sh- to say quite loudly, I think it was sort of like, Megaliths. Like that. And he did. He went in there, snuck in, and uh, went megaliths, and the whole of the hypogeum was ringing with the word megaliths. After that, every single site we had, we had the Maltese police following us uh, around. But uh, that was a, a thing. Now, here we have the Maltese long skulls uh, here. And we have uh, what I think was someone associated with uh, the Glastonbury Tor area, and he's a male there. In this Oxford paper, they said they were almost identical. The Maltese, and especially around the Glastonbury area, the identical people. I think they could have even been related uh, to, uh, to a certain degree. Certainly, Brian Forrester, that looks into the uh, elongated skulls of Paracas in Peru, said that they were the royalty or the priesthood in some way. So when we look at these skulls, we are seeing the priests of old. And nobody in uh, this country has linked the people to the monuments. But in Egypt, if when I go to Egypt with people, you can say, oh yeah, it was Akhenaten. King Setai, you, and they did this, and they did Abydos, and they did this. We haven't got that in our land, but over the past two years, I have matched the skulls to all of our, well, a lot of our major, major monuments, because sometimes we're so overwhelmed by the monuments and the energies, we forget about the people that built them, and I think it's time to honour them. So what the people of Malta were doing in terms of energies They were looking for very similar energy patterns, which they were depicting in beautiful spiral artwork and these beautiful asp areas here, beautiful masonry work, all bringing the temple to life, bringing the kind of energies in. And in most temples, whether you go to Delphi or whether you go to Malta or whether you go to Ireland, you always have these bowl type uh, features. And this is where I think they were literally charging up a lot of the water is one interpretation of what they were doing because there's water erosion on the inside of these bowls. They were filling, filling them up, maybe using them as singing bowls. I don't know. But if we look very deep uh, into temple space, especially at places like Malta, and you walk into the holiest of holy areas, you go through these beautifully masonry cut areas into like a little chamber, uh, if you will. And that's where you have that beautiful living spiral pattern that's coming off that branch spiral. And you can literally feel the energies. They've called in some places off now. It's becoming harder and harder and harder to get to the energy zones. I don't know what it is about me, but I had another person on a tour. He was a total renegade. He actually worked at CERN. He was a top engineer, and he wanted to look at energies a bit differently. So he said, you seem different. I'll come on. I'll come on on one of your uh, Malta tours. But he broke rank. Actually, you, you can't break rank. They've got CCTV. But he went right into the holiest of holies, and he said, the more you go into that temple, the more intricate the artwork becomes, the more higher the energy becomes. Well, within about five minutes, you had again Maltese police saying, oh, God. And they're all looking at me. You're going to get thrown out. And I said, hang on a minute. And I couldn't think of anything to say. So I just went, well, he's from Switzerland. (laughs) He's from Switzerland. You know, blame him. But they took his camera and they deleted every single picture so that he couldn't show anyone. (coughs) This is kind of on the inside of a, a Maltese temple. Now, has anyone heard of car tracks? Aren't they amazing? They are really uh, an unsolved mystery. And when we uh, go to the car uh, ruts, as they're called, I mean, this is how deep they are. You know, they're definitely not for carts because some of them go off a cliff edge, they go into water. And this is called Clapham Junction. Seriously? Really? It is? Yeah? And uh, they go crisscrossy, crisscrossy like this. And I thought, being a dowser, I thought, oh, I can go decode this, you know, that'd be really, uh, really good. No earth energy. It was a very, very strange form of aerial energy, which we're still trying to figure that out. But it's not really following. In some parts, we'll 
uh, water lines, but not, not uh, all the way. And God love him, that's our renegade there, another six foot something Swiss, uh, Swiss guy. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, he was uh, he was overwhelmed. And incidentally, after that, he was a top. He worked on CERN and a particle physicist. And he told me the first experiment that was done it wasn't that whizzing round like we were told when we spoon fed that CERN. It was all going to whiz around and go round like that. No, they sent a particle from CERN on a straight line. Duh, we know what that is. To the Vatican. According to him, that was the first experiment that they did. You can't make it up, can you? You really can't. And I did promise Hugh Newman that towards the end of a presentation, I'd get in megalithomania for him. So if you do see Hugh Newman, say I did, we're going to uh, roll right uh, and the devil's quits next year. Hugh and I give a uh, uh, talk, and there's going to be Paul Devra there and everything. That's Hugh's plug. Um, but just before uh, it comes to an end, because how long is it left? About five minutes. Just before we come to the end, when we kind of leapfrog forward to the uh, Christian uh, era, they too were following these ancient wisdom of water laws. And in a true, when a, a font is in the right place in situ, it will be above one of these spiral or branch spiral patterns, charging the water up with energy. That's holy water proper. It's the alchemy of what's going on. And I'm sure we've all heard of the Devil's Den, haven't we? Again, that was probably a long-skulled uh, monument because it's, uh, it's Neolithic. That's the same placement as if you go to those causeway enclosures that are on the meeting point of two aquifers. And uh, I took a guy called Glenn Bruton there and showed us just over here the, uh, the point. But have you ever put your head inside of that? Yeah? Has anyone done that? Well, I was with, uh, again, a kind of really odd person that said, oh, look at the, look at the inside, Marie. It's got just enough room for your skull. I was going, really? And they said, yes. Yeah. So we put our heads in it, and it literally does. Your head becomes fixed in the devil's den, and he did some amazing, amazing sound toning. Again, you can't make it up. That is true. So next time you're in the devil's den, stick your head inside. Uh, you won't get a headache. You'll get something better. Now, just to, as we're coming to a close, even where in a Christian church they put the water, you know that holy water, and it, they have this area here, it's got like a little bowl here, that again is beneath the ground, charging that water up with a spiral pattern. You know, and that's literally right opposite, you know, the, uh, the picture of the uh, Masons there, that's a local, a local church. So all throughout our history, mankind has been working with water energies as much as alignments like ley lines or earth voltages or earth currents because deep beneath us, there's such purity uh, in the earth's innermost deep yin waters. So I would encourage you, next time you go to a stone circle at least, go to the near center, you'll be above that geospiral, Walk out to where the standing stones are. You're above the energizing area. If you're ever at a stone circle, especially one in the middle of nowhere, like Swinside or somewhere like that, feel the earth tide between sort of two and four in the morning. Take a big blanket and stuff. And maybe experience uh, ancient sites from a water perspective rather than just uh, an earth energy perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. That was, what an amazing talk. So much information there. Uh, it's difficult to, to digest it all. That's fantastic. Um, I think I shall be going out between two and four in the morning uh, in Avery uh, with a very warm coat. And <laughs>